I have resisted calls for military action because we cannot resolve someone else's civil war through force, particularly after a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. The situation profoundly changed, though, on August 21st, when Assad's government gassed to death over a thousand people, including hundreds of children. Ryan Doyle in for Michael Corrin this evening. The situation and issue of Syria continues to linger. Barack Obama, of course, delaying a military action in favor of handing the decision off to the U.S. Congress, where it is now being batted about. And Barack Obama, as you saw there the other night, making an appeal to the American people. But will it be enough? Uh, who knows in this circumstance is the real answer. Peter Morisi joins us at the University of Maryland. Uh, Peter, this is an interesting time period uh, for a number of different reasons, not just America on the international stage, but even the economy at home. Well, it certainly is. The economy is hardly recovering. It's, it's a very slow recovery, and a lot of questions are being raised about the wisdom of his policies, whether it's health care. You know, just last week, IBM threw its uh, uh, retired folks off their health plan, because of rising costs. No one thought they'd ever see that. Uh, and, or is it foreign policy? I mean, it, things are, the wheels are coming off the Obama administration, and we should not be surprised. This idea of handing it off to Congress, you know, I mentioned the other night that you've had other presidents in the past, uh, whether it's Truman in Korea, whether it's Ronald Reagan in situations like Grenada or Panama, or even Bill Clinton, if we look at the situation in Haiti or Kosovo. He, they went it alone. They decided not to go to Congress and go through with those actions. I, I mean, when we compare Barack Obama over time to those presidents, where does he stack up as far as this decision is concerned? Well, he looks very indecisive. Presidents have gone to Congress, but they usually have done it when they have a reservoir of capital to get what they want. For example, Johnson with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Uh, the problem Mr. Obama has is that he has disavowed the notion of American leadership. He spent the first two years kowtowing and apologizing to everybody for George Bush. Uh, and he has disavowed the legitimacy of the use of force. So how can he ask Congress, which is packed with liberals in the House of Representatives, to approve something they don't believe in and that he has told them they shouldn't believe in? Essentially, his own rhetoric and bravado are coming back to haunt him. You, can't run the, you cannot run American foreign policy by, quote, leading from behind. And you can't run the U.S. economy on the liberal doctrines of, uh, 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 of, a, of a, say, a food co-op or a, a cooperative daycare center or something. The man's a community activist. He's in over his head and it shows. Well, it does show. When you talk about that bravado, we've, of course, heard this red line over and over again, the statement that was made a year ago. There is no good to it. There's no good to drawing that line in the sand if there is no actual consequence behind it. How much does, does the United States, though, as a whole suffer from those kind of words when there are no consequences behind those words? Well, I think American foreign policy is going to suffer dearly for this. The Europeans certainly expect us to bail them out when they get in trouble. I just love the Germans. The Germans never carry their own water, but they like to specify the size of the bucket we use and how much water we put in every bucket whenever we're called upon to do it, or circumstances require it of us, and their direct interests are not, you know, not at play. They become very moralistic and, and, and very good Canadians, so to speak, in, in advocating adherence to international law and all that. Uh, it hurts us a great deal. What happens to the next in line? I've always thought of this question as I watched the president the other night. I thought to myself, you know, this might not be your problem down the road and likely won't be. You're going to hand this off to somebody, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. They're going to inherit a problem that is bigger than the one that probably existed when Barack Obama took office. Well, whether it's the economy or uh, the foreign policy, the, it is going to be much more difficult for the next president than it was for Mr. Obama. Mr. Obama would have you believe that he inherited a situation where the economy was in the worst shape since the Great Depression. Not so. Mr. Reagan had to deal with even bigger problems. Uh, and that he, you know, had to rebuild American foreign policy because somehow or other, you know, George Bush was an absolute fool. And, you know, with the New York Times potentially, cr you know, cranking out this stuff, uh, you know, Americans believed it. And somehow or other, you know, if we started to run the place, like a faculty committee at the University of Chicago, we'd succeed. What you basically saw here was a man that's not smart enough, that wasn't able to be man enough to do the right thing two or three weeks ago. When they crossed the red line, 
you, first of all, you don't draw a red line if you intend on going to Congress to ask permission to enforce the red line. You draw the red line, then you have to enforce it. And, you know, he didn't have the foresight to see the consequences of doing that without congressional support. And, and, and now he's back down. It's, it's that simple. He doesn't have the courage to do the job. Mr. Obama sounds real good talking like I am right now in front of a room full of his supporters at a university gymnasium. But there's one thing he won't do, and that's debate anyone like me. Well, it, because, frankly, we'd whip his tail. Well, it's a very good point. You mentioned the New York Times as well, and I'm interested to get your thoughts very quickly. Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, uh, writing an editorial yeah. in the New York Times today, talking about how uh, an attack on Syria would cause perhaps more terrorism in the world. We should be taking the diplomatic route. Uh, I'm not sure America wants to be following foreign policy written by a former member of the KGB, but maybe that's just me. Well, no, it doesn't. But then again, the Germans do, and the Europeans do generally. I mean, right now, who's got the influence in Europe? The Germans, or excuse me, the Russians or the Americans. I think it's time to pull, pull American troops back behind the, the Rhine. And, you know, if the French will welcome them and so forth, there isn't much left there, but to take the tripwire out of Germany and tell them, listen, you want to do business with the Russians? You're on your own. Yeah, it'll be interesting in the days and weeks to, uh, to come to see where the president goes as far as uh, whether or not he decides to go it alone after uh, a congressional vote and whether or not uh, he just respects Congress, which would make him basically and essentially, in my mind, a lame duck. But we appreciate your time on this this afternoon, this evening. Well, yeah, I think one final word is that he is going to be in a situation where Putin defines the pace of events and they'll drag this out and put him in virtually an untenable position. Thanks so much. Take care.